The Supreme Court today ruled that abortion is completely a private matter to be decided by mother and doctor in the first three months of pregnancy. One of the most consequential Supreme Court decisions in history has brought nearly 50 years of federal abortion rights to an end. I am angry. I am angry because I have lived in an America where there was no protection from Roe versus Wade. This great nation can now live up to its core principle that all are created equal, not born equal, created equal. We could be talking about forced birth in a country that does not have paid leave, that does not have child care. Oh, oh. What is in this ruling? What will it mean for the people of Massachusetts? And what protections do our current laws provide? People in Massachusetts cannot get comfortable. It's not like people in Massachusetts can look and say, well, you know, we're not Texas, we're not Louisiana, we're okay. The people who have spent decades trying to overturn Roe v. Wade see daylight now. Today's historic Supreme Court decision is a victory for the sanctity of life. It will save countless innocent children. As clinics cancel appointments in states with new abortion bans, will Massachusetts become a beacon for abortion access? And what other rights could be at risk now that Roe v. Wade has been undone? This Supreme Court has overturned Roe, and with that, put in question other things as well. Marriage equality, contraception. Who knows where this ends? Join us for a special broadcast as we talk through the reverberations of this historic Supreme Court ruling. We'll look at the legal implications, we'll talk through the status of abortion access and reproductive rights in Massachusetts, and we'll be having this conversation with you, hearing your stories and answering your questions along the way. A community conversation on the overturning of Roe is next on 89.7 GBH and streaming live on youtube.com slash GBH news. Welcome to Community Conversation, Row Overturned. We are live on 89.7 GBH and streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. Broadcasting from our GBH studio here at the Boston Public Library. I'm joined by my colleagues Paris Alston, co-host co of Morning Edition, and Marjorie Egan, co-host of Boston Public Radio. We're gathering to talk through the reverberations of the Supreme Court's historic ruling that has overturned Roe v. Wade. We'll be talking through what the decision means for the people of Massachusetts, what this means for reproductive rights, and the vulnerable communities who will be hit the hardest. The 6-3 decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization means that states will be able to make their own laws around abortion. As of today, Abortion is now banned in at least seven states, with trigger bans in several more set to take effect. Joining us to talk through the decision is law professor Renee Landers. She is the faculty director of the Health and Biomedical Law Concentration and the Masters of Science in Law Life Sciences Program at Suffolk University Law School. Renee Landers, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me as part of this conversation. Now, this is a conversation that we are also having with you. We want to hear how this ruling will affect you. What questions and concerns do you have now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned? We want to hear from all points of view. We welcome all points of view. If you support abortion, if you are anti-abortion, if you are conflicted about the overturning of Roe v. Wade, give us a call or text us at 877-301-8970. 877-301-8970. You can tweet us at GBH News. If you're here in the audience at the Boston Public Library, you can ask a question too by alerting our colleague, Rebecca Talbert. All right, Renee, let's start off this way. I want everybody to be on the same page. We've all heard the decision. Uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned, but there was a case brought to the Supreme Court uh, which was the vehicle by which the court decided to overturn Roe v. Wade. So first, exactly what does the ruling say? So the, um, the case that was, uh, uh, the, that generated the Supreme Court's decision in this case was brought um, by the state of Mississippi 
uh, uh, well, it actually was uh, initiated by a, a women's health clinic in Jackson, Mississippi, against the Mississippi law that um, uh, prohibits abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy, of gestation during a pregnancy. Um, under the Roe v. Wade and uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey precedents, um, the constitutional rule was that abortion had to be available um, without an undue burden until fetal viability, which right now is at about 23 or 24 weeks gestation. So Mississippi was actually, you know, uh, passed this law deliberately to try to test that viability standard in Roe and Casey. Um, and so uh, the Supreme Court uh, accepted the case for review um, after the lower federal court um, overturned, invalidated the statute, said it was invalid under Supreme Court precedents. And the Supreme Court accepted the case for review on the question of whether this 15 week, um, uh, this ban starting at 15 weeks was constitutional. Uh, but um, as the case evolved, uh, many people in Mississippi itself, the state of Mississippi got on the bandwagon of urging the court to use this case as a vehicle for just scrapping the right to uh, the constitutional right to abortion entirely, and with the um, uh, you know conservative uh, uh, the heavy uh, conservative uh, weight of the Supreme Court, uh, the justices had six uh, well actually five votes to abandon the Roe Casey um, you know, uh, uh, regime and uh, protection for abortion rights. Uh, and then the sixth vote was Chief Justice Roberts, who said he would have upheld the Mississippi statute, uh, but just changed, uh, you know, moved the kind of uh, the baseline from the 23, 24 weeks fetal viability point to 15 weeks and upheld the Mississippi statute. So his approach was a more modest uh, revision of the Casey and Roe framework. So what does that mean exactly, uh, 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 John, Chief Justice John Roberts' comment there? Um, will it have any legal impact at all? Because in the end, he joined with the majority. But what does, usually when there is a dissent or a comment made along with a ruling, that's a signal uh, that has meaning down the road potentially. So what does his statement mean? Well, um, you know, I think it doesn't mean very much in this context. I think that, you know, he um, has been, um, you know, argued that the judiciary should have some modesty in overturning legislative uh, enacted statutes or in um, overturning precedents. And so I think that he was trying to take, uh, you know, uphold the law, which respects the legislature's enactment in Mississippi but at the same time, respect the fundamental precedent in Casey and Roe that um, there was a right to abortion uh, up to a certain point during a pregnancy. So as a moderate, but um, I think that he, um, you know, the, you know, some the, some of the abortion rights advocates had hoped that at a minimum that that position would be the worst case scenario in the decision in the Dobbs case. Uh, but he, Chief Justice Roberts, was obviously not able to bring along um, the other conservative members of the court to that point of view because they were bent uh, on, on overturning Roe and Casey. Also, in the majority, of course, Clarence Thomas. And he took a moment to make a separate statement as well. Again, what does that mean or could mean potentially? Um, I read, and I think many commentators read, that uh, Justice Thomas's statement. Uh, that, First, let's say uh, what he said. Did yes, you, I will you, say what he said. Okay, that, great. That he, um, uh, his, his view was that uh, he joined the majority opinion because he thinks it was the right result. Um, he, uh, for many, many years, has um, disliked and expressed his profound dislike for the Supreme Court's jurisprudence in this whole area of um, substantive due process rights, which is where, uh, in, in constitutional doctrine, the right to abortion sits. But also sitting in that area are the rights uh, to uh, same-sex marriage, the right to use contraception. Uh, and so um, uh, he was arguing in his concurrence, he agreed with the result because it was consistent you know, with uh, you know, his view of what substantive due process should allow. Uh, but he was urging the court to revisit all those other precedents 
that were decided under the same doctrine. So um, I think it's a shopping list for people to begin challenging these other, you know, the same sex marriage, uh, the right to contraception. So I think that that's why people are expressing, um, you know, concern over what might happen in the future. Uh, one case that he didn't raise to be revisited is interracial marriage. He happens to be in one, but according to the list that he uh, put in, the, in his uh, statement, that too would fall in the category as he uh, has determined that some of these cases need to be revisited. Is that right? Yes, um, yes, up to a point. But the um, Loving v. Virginia is the interracial marriage case. And that case um, was based on two different constitutional foundations. One was the Equal Protection Clause and the other one was the Due Process Clause. So yes, you're right that the reasoning uh, you know, related to the Due Process Clause you know, might go by the wayside if the court decides to review these other precedents. But there's still that equal protection po a component under Loving v. Virginia. Uh, but I guess the, one of the larger points I would make here, this is a good opportunity to make this point. Um, the Dobbs decision, the, court, the majority opinion uh, by Justice Alito in Dobbs uh, rests a lot of the rationale on um, that the rights protected in the Constitution either have to be specifically stated in the Constitution or they have to be found in the history and traditions of the country. Um, that's an inherently backward looking approach to the evolution of the law. Um, there is no, um, and I've always disliked this test for that reason. And even the very first Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall said, you know, we're, we're interpreting a constitution that's supposed to be adaptable to the crises and changes in human experience. And that history and tradition test um, does not allow the Constitution to evolve with the times. And I think that because of that rationale, if the court were to apply it to the Equal Protection Clause, even a case like Loving would be at risk. Hmm. All right, look, any calls, Marjorie? Uh, yes, we, we, uh, we have a Daniel from Marlboro who's calling. He's a veteran in support of choice. Daniel, thank you very much for calling. What's, what's up? Hello, thank you for taking my call. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. I really appreciate, appreciate you letting me uh, speak my piece. Thanks for calling. Um, so I'm, I'm a veteran, I'm a combat veteran. I served in Iraq and Afghanistan. I've bled for this country. I've watched friends die just to come back to watch half of the population lose the constitutional rights I swore to protect. Um, the 4th of July for me is canceled. Instead of fireworks, I will be joining thousands of other veterans and burning my uniforms in protest. And I want <clears throat> the, uh, the women that are listening to know, veterans, stand with you. We support you. We will fight with you. If you have a protest plan and you don't feel safe, reach out to Wall of Vets. They have provided security for pro-choice protests in the past. Um, where where is this happening, Daniel? You. Where is this burning of the uniforms happening? What are you talking about? This is mostly done online, on private social media accounts, shared across TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. Um, you can find thousands of, of veterans that have already done so, and more will be doing so on 4th of July. Thank you very much for the call, Daniel. And we have a question here at the Boston Public Library. My name is Alette, and I came down here especially to offer the adoptee perspective. Um, I am an adoptee from the baby scoop era, and I'll tell you that our adoptee friends are not doing well right now. Um, I'm an adoptee and a rape survivor, and even with all of that, I am pro-choice. Uh, I don't think people consider the trauma of a baby being removed from their mother. Um, Normally, a baby and their mother, there's self-soothing by the mother, but if the baby's taken away right away, the baby has to learn how to self-soothe. And studies, and there are true studies out there that show elevated cortisol levels, um, babies need be needing to self-soothe, and that can lead down the road to addiction levels being a lot higher in adoptees. Depression is a lot higher, increased suicidality, ADD, 
And I want to make sure to say that I was adopted into a home uh, with a lot of money, a lot of opportunity, excellent education. I had love, but all of the love and all of the money doesn't negate that initial trauma. And um, I feel lucky to have been in a good home, but even then, I have suffered depression, suicidality, and it doesn't help also that I'm a veterinarian, so that's a higher rate of suicidality. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for having this open conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you, so for, thank sharing. you for sharing. Thank that you story. Story. for much for sharing that. So we should point out that one of the chief, one of the justices on the Supreme Court, Amy Coney Barrett, mm -hmm. uh, who's a mother of seven, two of them adopted, uh, in her confirmation hearings seemed to imply that it was not a big deal for a woman yeah. who has an unwanted pregnancy to just go through adoption and give the baby away. You're belying uh, that mm -hmm. in what you said to us today. It's, it the, is the a other. huge deal. And the other thing, too, um, being a transracial adoptee adopted into a white family, that is a whole other can of worms. Oh, and just because an adoptee is uh, not doing well or suffering depression has nothing to do with lack of love. There's, there's more to it. Thank you. Thank you very that. much. For Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's Renee, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to say that um, these, uh, both of these comments have been very um, compelling and very moving to me. I mean, I'm the daughter of a, 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 a 20 plus year veteran of the US Army. So I really do uh, appreciate the devotion of any members of the military to supporting constitutional rights. I also think that the second comment about um, adoption not being just this complete panacea um, is really important because the court in the opinion in Dobbs uh, really overlooked uh, the difficulties uh, that women experience in pregnancy and that and in the uh, and in raising children. And that, um, you know, just because, you know, the law uh, happens to prohibit discrimination against pregnancy or against people with children and employment and whatnot, doesn't mean it doesn't happen and doesn't mean it's still a very challenging um, thing to do, um, especially if the person uh, did not want to be a parent. And so I think that uh, the court has this kind of Pollyanna-ish view of uh, you know what what um, pregnancy is like, and they just don't respect um, that there is uh, you know that there are other interests involved other than protecting fetal life um, that are involved in this question of abortion. Kelly, if I could, I want to pick up on what the the first caller said mentioning that the 4th of July is canceled for him, right? Mm -hmm. There is an era of patriotism that is permeating this Supreme Court decision and or lack of, thereof. I mean, this, this sentiment that our values are not settled, let alone our laws at this point as we're seeing. So Renee, I'm wondering from you, how does a legal system and one with such power as the Supreme Court interpret the law when even, when you're talking about law based on values, we don't even really have a consensus on what our values are right now? Well, that, that's a really excellent question, which is why, um, you know, and I think that there have been uh, several cases this term decided by the court, which uh, really raised that, bring that question to the fore. Uh, you know, the case earlier this week about, uh, you know, prayer by, uh, you know, a high school uh, football coach, um, all these sorts of things seem to be reverting to this kind of 1954 50s notion that we're a Christian nation and that we, that values should be traditional ones where, you know, women, uh, you know, their primary job was to uh, have and raise children and uh, worry about the home sector and not be um, so concerned with, you know, their role in the world. Now, um, and so I think that, um, uh, you know, people do have very, you know, different views about values, but the important thing about the law and what Roe um, allowed was for people to make their own choices about which values they would prefer. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if, if a woman wanted to, you know, primarily have the role as a wife and, uh, and caretaker for children, great. Um, if a woman wanted to have some other role, role uh, Roe allowed that possibility um, more so than the, than, you know, the regime we're looking at will allow. And so um, I think it's very hard for the court um, to you know, come down on one side or another about these values. And um, uh, the Alito decision also seemed to think that Roe had caused controversy 
And by eliminating Roe, the con controversy would go away. Well, as we've seen, even since the decision, um, it's, it's going to this elimination of Roe and the actions of states in trying to prohibit abortion, trying to prohibit their citizens from leaving the state to obtain abortions, trying to prohibit their citizens from getting medication abortions, uh, you know, through the mail or however, um, this will spawn more litigation that uh, likes of which the court has not seen. So um, it, it, it's sort of in a way like the Dred Scott case where the Supreme Court thought it was gonna solve this sort of slavery rights question once and for all, and the result of which was the Civil War. So I think, um, you know, I'm not predicting war here necessarily, but I, I do think that the, the controversy is going to only be exacerbated because of this and because the court um, refused uh, to um, take the position on, of neutrality with respect to values, as you were suggesting, Paris. And from a legal standpoint, Renee, when is settled law settled then? Um, I think this whole experience that uh, we've, we've had with this Dobbs case and some of the um, cases, um, you know, about the ability of the government to uh, 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 impose public health measures, you know, in response to the pandemic, uh, raise a serious question. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, um, it, it, that, that it's hard to know what the answer to that question is uh, anymore if um, every court, uh, you know, that has a shifting majority can uh, come along and change these very longstanding precedents. Now, you know, I know that the conservatives think that, well, Roe was wrong, so we were justified. But um, actually, I wanted to point out that there's a, another there, in addition to the concurrence uh, that Thomas wrote with his little shopping list of other rights that he'd like to see eliminated, um, there is a footnote in the main opinion, uh, footnote 48, which lists all these um, cases which overturned prior court precedents. Mm -hmm. I think that's another shopping list by the court. Mm -hmm. And um, on that list are cases like Brown versus Board of Education, which is never quite settled in comfortably. It's sort of like, Roe, we all nod, oh yes, you know, uh, you know, race discrimination and segregation is unlawful. But you know, a, a lot of people are not happy with that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I think there's another longer shopping list. Um, one last case I will note is um, uh, the the, you know, the Miranda decision. You know your yeah. Miranda rights. You have a right to be silent. You know if you're arrested, you don't have to uh, be a witness against yourself. Well, um, this the week that the court decided Dobbs, it decided another case in which it weakened the the right to uh, have uh, things that you would say without your Miranda warnings used against you in a trial. So I I think that a lot of rights are at risk and that nothing right now is particularly settled law with this court. Um, President Biden this morning was uh, at a press conference in NATO. Uh, he agrees with you. Here he is addressing the Supreme Court overruling Roe v. Wade. The one thing that has been destabilizing is the outrageous behavior of the Supreme Court of the United States on overruling not only Roe v. Wade, but essentially challenging the right to privacy. We've been a leader in the world in terms of personal rights and privacy rights. And it is a mistake, in my view, for the Supreme Court to do what it did. Uh, yeah, you guys could show me which call we're going to go to next. But meanwhile, we have a call from a woman, a uh, text from a woman who's older and talks about how uh, when she was 10 years old, and she's 75, so she grew up way before uh, uh, Roe. When I was 10 years old, my, my good friend's 16-year-old sister died. She was so fun and outgoing and smart and pretty. When I got older, I found out she was the victim of an illegal abortion. As I overheard the ruling today, well, it wasn't today, but when it came down a few days back, I found myself crying for her all over again. I feel many more women will die um, from illegal abortions. Th that's the other thing that I wondered about, the medical mm -hmm. abortion and mm -hmm. where that will fit in uh, in preventing people from doing what they used to do with uh, back alley so-called abortions. Mm -hmm. Renee, uh, medical abortions, I think, are about half of all of the abortions. Uh, some of that uh, increased during the time of COVID particularly. Mm -hmm. But as we know, that's been banned in certain states. We should say, as I haven't said, just to be clear, abortion is legal in Massachusetts. Correct. Um, and there have been two steps since 
uh, the Roe v. Wade decision came down to shore up the legality in uh, Massachusetts. One is an executive order by uh, Charlie Baker, our governor, and another, last night, the House voted with even more specific kinds of um, uh, points that they wanted to make to make sure that uh, gender nonconforming folks um, a as well as um, women are not deterred from have, being able to get an abortion in Massachusetts. There's funding available, there's insurance. There's a lot of details that are on the table now. The Senate has, to, has a version of it. They'll reconcile and we'll see that. But my point is this. Um, uh, one of the things that is, is, is right in the center, it seems to me, of legality is this uh, tele, telemedicine medical abortions, legal in Massachusetts, but we are expecting an influx of people from across uh, from other states. Are we protected legally or can we be protected legally? Well, yeah, I mean, this, the, the, all of these measures that you just um, listed, Callie, are intended to, um, to add some protections. Um, among them are to um, protect uh, uh, abortion providers, healthcare providers in Massachusetts uh, from, uh, be, uh, from uh, lawsuits by um, people from out of state, um, you know, who are uh, uh, challenging, uh, you know, the provision of a service that's, as you noted, legal in Massachusetts. If someone from Texas, say, comes to Massachusetts and obtains an abortion under Texas law, um, that person uh, could, be could be prosecuted or anyone who helped them could be prosecuted, i.e., in theory, the abortion provider in Massachusetts. And so all of these laws are intended to try to protect providers from those kinds of, um, you know, really uh, nuisance lawsuits um, from people in these other states. Um, the um, the problem is you still might have to defend them, and so um, so the but the law protecting them from you know the Massachusetts from courts from taking action against them, uh, from uh, compelling the production of medical records, all that sort of thing. Are, they're very helpful and necessary steps and that, that the governor and that the Massachusetts legislature are taking. Uh, but, uh, you know, you still have to have a lot of, um, you know, lawyers uh, to defend against the actions that will come. And I think that they will come. People will try. Um, and then on the um, telehealth issue, um, the, the problem with the way healthcare, one of the problems with the way healthcare is organized in the United States is that you know all of the licensing um, of healthcare professionals is, is done by the states, and so um, you know the basic rule is that a provide in order to provide healthcare in a particular state, the physician must be licensed in the state where the patient is. Now, if the patient comes to Massachusetts, that issue in theory goes away, um, but if the uh, you know a provider or a pharmacy sends medication uh, to uh, induce an abortion into the other state, um, you know that raises this question about licensing. Um, it also raises this question about whether a state actually has within its power hmm. to prohibit um, a, a drug approved as safe and effective by the FDA from being used by its citizens in the state for the purpose of inducing an abortion. Now, um, Attorney General Merrick Garland, um, the day Dobbs was decided, announced that the position of the Justice Department was going to be that those laws are unconstitutional. And um, if you have time and you're interested to know, we can get into what the reason is for that. But I think that, um, uh, you know, there, there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of uh, law and a lot of legal controversy to be resolved as a result of the Dobbs case. You know what you're saying, Renee and Marjorie, I thought about this when you shared that text with us. I'm thinking about, you know, for people who are going to be going, going to get these illegal abortions, if something goes wrong, what does that mean for the landscape of a malpractice lawsuit, for instance, or trying to seek some retribution for that procedure having gone wrong, but then you're also opening up a web of legal ties resulting from that, I imagine. That's if somebody knows about it. That, so, exactly. I, so, I, so I, I predict it's all underground, yeah. as it used to be yeah. back in the bad old or days. Or you, you, know? you do think, too, with the medical abortions, if do, they are very safe and very successful, but if something does go, go wrong, wrong yeah. and you need medical care, does that open you up to arrest? Or if you have right. a miscarriage uh, of a wanted pregnancy, that's quite scary as well, Renee. 
Yeah, no, so I think Marjorie, your point is really good that um, um, because of these laws and the possibility of people being prosecuted, it may deter people who need medical assistance because you know the uh, you know the medication abortion didn't work um, as it usually does, uh, or you know there were you know some unique thing that happened that requires medical assistance. Um, that's a very dangerous thing um, because um, even though um, uh, you know you know uh, to you know having laws that actually might deter people from seeking necessary medical care is is, is just really not um, uh, an appropriate thing. The other. Um, uh, thing that the Dobbs mistake that the Dobbs case makes is that um, it kind of assumes that none of these things ever go wrong in a typical pregnancy. Um, but actually, the rate of miscarriage is, um, is it, you know, it's a fairly common event. And um, so if women are afraid of being um, accused of being wrongdoers or their doctors yeah. from providing the standard medical care so that the woman's health is protected in the event of miscarriage, uh, which you know looks a, a, a lot like an abortion. It may in fact be an abortion to protect the woman's health. Um, that's a very dangerous situation for women in this country. And the United States already has the highest maternal mortality rate of any developed country in the world, um, which is not a fact to be proud of. And this will only exacerbate that problem. And highest for women of color. Thank yes. you so much, um, Renee Landers, for joining us. Renee thank Landers, thank you very much for having me. You know, yes, thank great. you, thank you, Renee. Renee Landers is a professor of law and faculty director of the Health and Biomedical Law Concentration and the Masters of Science in Law Life Sciences program at Suffolk University Law School. Coming up, we look at the state of reproductive rights and abortion access with Rebecca Hart Holder, Executive Director of Reproductive Equity Now. The community conversation continues on 89.7 GBH and live on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash GBH News. Broadcasting from our GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. Stay with us. part of your community. You're gonna to start to see a lot more ways in which GBH News opens the door to our station to make sure that this is a two-way conversation with the public. We're public media, so this makes sense that this is what we're doing. So we'll be in coffee shops, we'll be in libraries, and most importantly, if you have an idea for where you might want GBH News staff to sit down with a particular group of people, write to me. To contact Annie Schreffler, visit gbhnews.org contact. Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And Bunker Hill Community College, offering six-week summer sessions for students looking to get ahead or learn a new skill. The next session starts July 18th. Registration is open, bhcc.edu slash summer. And Hopkinton Center for the Arts, presenting live band concerts Friday and Saturday nights starting at 6.30. Tickets and details on their summer arts series at hopartscenter.org, funded in part by the Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism. I'm Paris Austin. Welcome back to Community Conversation, Row Overturned. We're live on 89.7 GBH and streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. We're broadcasting from our GBH studio at the Boston Public, Li Public Library, and I'm joined by my colleagues Callie Crossley, host of Under the Radar with Callie Crossley, and Marjorie Egan, co-host of Boston Public Radio. Now, if you're just tuning in, we're gathering today to talk through the overturning of Roe v. Wade and what it means for the people of Massachusetts. We just spoke with Suffolk University law professor Renee Landers about the legal reverberations of the Supreme Court ruling, and now we're looking at what this means for reproductive rights in Massachusetts and beyond. In 2020, the Massachusetts legislature passed the Roe Act, which removed anti-abortion laws from the books and codified the right to safe legal abortion but is there more that the state can do to expand abortion access and reproductive rights in light of the ruling? Joining us to talk through that is Rebecca Hart Holder, Executive Director of Reproductive Equity Now. We also want to hear from you, our audience, your experiences, your reactions to this ruling. We welcome and encourage all points of view, whether you are encouraged or motivated 
or upset or any of it being along the spectrums of emotions, you can call or text us at 877-301-8970. 877-301-8970, or you can tweet us at GBH News. And if you're here in our live audience at the Boston Public Library, you can ask a question by alerting our colleague, Rebecca Tauber, and there's a mic here for you to come up and speak with us. Rebecca Hartholder, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Rebecca, the Massachusetts House passed a bill last night that codifies uh, abortion access and abortion rights in Massachusetts. Why don't you start by giving us your reaction to the passing of that bill? Well, I think most importantly, the Senate acted immediately upon the Dobbs leak with kind of the vehicle that they had available, the budget, and then the House reacted right away as soon as um, Roe was overturned. So I'm, I'm really heartened that there's multiple vehicles moving on Beacon Hill that can, you know, do what we've been calling for, which is to expand access here in the Commonwealth. We're very lucky that we have the legal right codified, but we really do have to work on expanding access to care here. And how would you like to see that happen? One of the most important things that we can tackle right now are protections for providers and patients. So you've probably seen news that the state of Texas, for example, um, is considering legislation where they could try to reach into the Commonwealth and create civil or criminal penalties for abortion providers offering lawful care here in Massachusetts. That is totally unacceptable. We have to make sure that our providers can continue to provide care without fear of civil criminal penalties, without fear of something happen to, happening to their license and without fear of implications for their medical malpractice insurance. And so Governor Charlie Baker signed an executive order shortly after the ruling, barring Massachusetts from cooperating with any extradition attempts uh, from other states connected to reproductive care, also protecting providers from professional discipline, um, trying to put some things into place to protect people who might be seeking um, or are working in this space. Do you think that is enough? Do you think that executive order will put enough of those protections in place? I was really heartened by what the governor did. I have been a critic of his in the past, but um, I want to call out good action when I see it, but it's not enough. Um, we need to put it in law. Um, the governor also um, left out uh, the fact that they're trying to regulate the provision of gender affirming care as well. It is not a coincidence that the state of Texas went after abortion with SBA and then shortly after that went after health care for trans kids. So we have to make sure that that our providers here in the Commonwealth are protected. Um, we also want to see the legislature strengthen some of the, um, we've been calling it kind of slow rolling. You know, we would have to cooperate with an investigation, but it doesn't mean that, that, um, that our investigative branches here in the Commonwealth have to make it easy to cooperate. Mm -hmm. Can I just, uh, Rebecca, one, just to pick up, uh, what about regular folk? So we are protecting providers in the healthcare industry, but if regular folk help mm -hmm. other people, is there a legal protection that could be codified as well? Yeah, so we, um, in, the, in the Senate language, we talk about kind of, uh, and the kind of layperson's term is the helpers. We talk about all the other people, the abortion funds, you know, the taxi driver, everyone who kind of helps along the way when someone comes into Massachusetts trying to get care, the receptionist at Planned Parenthood or an independent clinic, um, you know, the physician's assistant. We wanna make sure that everybody is protected. You know, it's interesting that you raise that, Callie, because I had seen some things circling uh, just on my social media feeds of people who were off in Massachusetts or in other states where abortion is still legal, offering their homes, offering to yes. help people and, and, you know, transportation, whatever it may be. Or if you donate to an abortion care fund, for instance, could, does all of that fall into that category as well, Rebecca? Yeah, and abortion funds are the people that have been doing this work for decades. They really know how to make sure that folks have the resources they need. And so it was a huge priority for us to make sure that the funds were protected as part of the, um, you know, the provider and patient protections that we're looking at. We got some calls. Yeah, we do. Let's take, let's take a call from Dr. K from Fall River. Dr. K, you are on the air. Please go ahead. You're with Rebecca Hartholder and us. Hi there, I'm really happy to hear you guys doing this forum. Thank you. I am somebody who has been working in primary care my entire career, 
particularly with women's health and with care of the underserved. I feel as though we became a little complacent thinking that we were safe with Roe in place. Those of us who agree to work for the federal government in federally funded health centers who accept the fact that our hands are tied from providing any abortion care to our patients. I just wonder right now with the changing landscape in terms of the federal administration and the way that we're framing the discussions around voting in the midterms and what our legislature looks like for how we um, pass budgets and what we allow to be paid for by federally funded programs, um, whether anything exciting or new is happening in that regard. Rebecca? Yeah, um, you know, I think we saw this, the, advocate, the advocacy community saw very clearly on October 6, 2018, what was coming. And that was the day that Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed to the United States Supreme Court. This is not a shock. Um, this is something that we have been singularly focused on with passage of the Roe Act, with repeal of our pre-Roe criminal abortion ban here in Massachusetts, with expansion of access to contraception. This is the promise of a President Donald Trump, that, and he delivered. He delivered for people. Um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of people are shocked that Roe fell. Um, you know, there simply has not been the votes in Congress to codify abortion rights. And so, you know, I've been kind of shouting from the rooftops for a long time that we have to be investing in states. That's, you know, the anti-choice movement invested for decades in state legislatures, in state Supreme Courts, in secretaries of state to manipulate voting. We have to be doing the same on our side because the federal government is just simply not coming to save us. So with that, I mean, is the... Can the demand, can, you, can the action meet the demand, essentially? Because I guess I'm wondering how quickly, we know in some of these states, they're in those trigger all states, this immediately has gone into effect. Some of them are waiting, what, 30 days after the ruling. Some places may take a little longer. Some places will maintain having the right to an abortion. But with things moving so quickly, is the advocacy going to be able to keep up with that? That's a great question. Um, I, you know, I, I will say I never thought that we would be we would need the provider protections that in fact we are going to need to keep our providers safe. We have to look at this as a tidal wave. You know, the states that are going to be absorbing patients from states like Missouri and Texas that have outlawed abortion care are the states that border them. But, you know, Illinois uh, is, is projecting that they'll have 20 to 30,000 more patients a year. Their healthcare system simply cannot absorb that number of patients. And so it will begin to spill over to other states where care is legal. If you can get on a flight to Massachusetts, if you have family here, if you have friends here, if you went to school here, you'll come here if you can scrape that money together. So I think you're right. This is, this is an evolution. This is us watching what's happening over the next 12 to 18 months. And and being as nimble as we po possibly can be to make sure that we can get the, the, the safety net in place for folks coming here for care. Marjorie, do we have any Yeah, we have a very in? bleak text from Heather from New Hampshire. And she's talking about how you hear a lot of people that are uh, anti-abortion say they have to step up now with more services for women. Uh, but she says she was had the realization while Renee Landers was talking that they don't really support these things because, in her view, they do not want women to be independent. They want them to be home at the mercy of their husbands, having children, popping out children is how she put it, becoming stuck as second-class citizens. The very religious and the very misogynist who don't want women to succeed outside the home and forced pregnancy will accomplish that. Um, and she basically is talking about what I think a lot of women feel, that we have suddenly become second-class citizens in the United States of America. We'll talk about this later in the hour, but there is really not an equality anymore between men and women because there is no, uh, we are the vessels um, mm -hmm. under surveillance. Yeah, look, if, if the federal government was serious about making sure that women had what, what they needed for gender equity, we would have passed paid family medical leave. We would have passed universal pre-K. We would have passed the omnibus, we would have passed the child tax credit and made it permanent, but they haven't been able to do it. So, you know, I hate to say it, but I, I share that, that bleak outlook right now. There is a group of people that want um, misogyny to prevail, that do not want women to be equal. And this is a, overturning Roe is a critical step in, in their plan. 
Um, Rebecca, all of the studies have shown that the, the people who are using, um, because they, for a number of reasons, are going to use abortion services are women of color or um, people, of, people who give birth of, um, of color. Where are we in terms of, given the racial dynamics in this country, I'm just trying to get my head around um, how that how that rolls out now because a number of those women are also low income as well mm -hmm. so the the pressure on the systems they weren't al already they weren't getting access to uh, a lot of the services that they need just regular health care services of which reproductive health care services are a major part so what's going to happen in terms of those kinds of pressures and how do you see that impacting the racial dynamics that are already fraught in this country. Yeah, there's no doubt that overturning Roe is going to disproportionately impact black and brown people, indigenous people, low income people, rural folks, you know, people who already have been at a disadvantage when it comes to access to services. Something I'm really concerned about is that some of our colleagues in Texas who run abortion funds have stopped providing funds for people because of the threat from Governor Abbott that they will be prosecuted mm -hmm. for helping um, for helping with abortion care. I, I, you know, I do not see a way forward that doesn't result in much more health care inequality. The fact of the matter is that if you have the resources to spend time trying to get through to an abortion fund whose phone lines are just overwhelmed right now with people who are scared and angry and who don't want to be pregnant and don't know what to do, it means that, you know, you already have the time off to spend the time on the phone, and then you're going to be able to get yourself to a place like New York, Massachusetts, Illinois, California. But if you're a shift worker, if you don't have childcare, if you don't have family that can help you, if you don't have a little bit of savings, you know, it's going to be very hard to get that in-person care. I mean, that is why we really have to increase um, access to medication abortion and get that into people's hands early. But, but frankly, this is, an, this, is a, this is a public health crisis for communities of color. Some have just flatly said women will die. What do you say? Women will die. And we can get women access to abortion care through medication abortion, and we have to do that quickly. We cannot let the United States Postal Service be regulated by states. We have to ensure that people can get the mail so that they can get medication abortion. You know, Rebecca, I'm thinking about um, some of our GBH colleagues, Hannah Rialli and Megan Smith, have done some reporting on medication abortion and how it's even hard to get it to places like Nantucket <laughs> and Martha's Vineyard. So let alone getting it to other states. I mean, wh what what is there to be done there? Yeah, you know, there are several pharmacies that work nationwide getting medication abortion to folks when they need it. Telehealth is going to be an incredibly important option, but I don't want to sugarcoat it. There are people that are not going to get access because it's going to be more difficult to get on that telehealth platform because pharmacies, you know, as states like Texas and Missouri try to regulate access to medication abortion will be afraid about their liability. Um, in, in, in mailing uh, pills. There is an organization um, that uh, is overseas that I think saw an 800% increase in requests coming out of Texas after SB8 for medication abortion pills. So there will be people working overseas, but um, hard to imagine that it doesn't have a profound impact on the healthcare system. We're talking to Rebecca Hartholder, who's the Executive Director of Reproductive Equity Now. As part of our community conversation, Roe overturned. And we also want to continue hearing from you, your experiences, your reactions to the ruling. You can call us or text us at 877-301-8970. That's 877-301-8970. Or tweet us at GBH News. And a reminder to our audience here at the Boston Public Library, please, if you have a question or a comment, just wave down our colleague, Rebecca Tauber. I think she, she might have been headed to the bathroom, but she's walking back this way. <laughs> but, and, and the microphone is she's right back. here. She's <laughs> back. She's back. So you could wave her down. Or Bessie from Rochester is on the phone. Bessie, thank you for calling. Oh, absolutely. I just want to say, as a retired clinician, I don't think this is the final ball that's going to drop. Hmm. I believe that we will find a workaround and give women the right to choose. Unfortunately, 
being able to overturn a ruling of a prior Supreme Court justice court, well, then what does it matter what decision they make today or tomorrow? Because they've set the rule now. You can change anything you want, pending political or social issues, and not uphold the Constitution or any ruling. Do they know they just shot themselves in the foot? Rebecca, do you have a response to that? Yeah, I, I don't think I um, I don't think I share the caller's faith in the ability to create workarounds. I think there are states that are just just dead set on um, controlling um, women and pregnant people's bodies, and um, they are they you know they are they're gerrymandered. It's hard for people to vote. It is going to be very hard to unseat the politicians in those states who, um, you know, who, who just are, are going to stand in the way of access to health care. You know, Chris from Boston also raised a very good point about uh, child abuse, which is a very serious problem in, in the United States and around the world. And uh, Chris is concerned that it, uh, whose sister works with child abuse uh, survivors, it, it seems like cases are more frequent uh, based on her call time. This is the sister's call time. And Chris says, I can't imagine about the frequency and severity of child abuse cases that they might be become even more horrible if a woman is who cannot deal with the pregnancy either because she's poor, she has other children she can't take care of, or she doesn't have the, uh, the she's not able at this stage in her life to, to become a mother. Um, as Chris put it, if she cannot follow her heart and is forced to uh, finish a pregnancy. Well, I don't know about you all, but um, I, I grew up with a number of kids who were not wanted. Mm -hmm. And the contrast from my house to theirs, I was so lucky is shocking and horrible, and it's nothing worse to see. Um, so, you know, I want parents to want to have those children. Yeah, yeah, Rebecca, Rebecca, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, I, there is a study from UCSF uh, called the Turnaway Study that talks about what happens to people when they are not able to get the um, abortion care that they want. It's a longitudinal study, so there's, there's, I think, nearly a decade of data. And what we know is that people have, you know, worse economic outcomes. Um, they're more likely to suffer, suffer mental health issues. Um, I do also know that, that, that women are resilient, and we have been fighting back for decades and hundreds of years, and we will continue to fight. But, but the impact on, on people and families is very real. And I think it's, um, it's really shameful what the court has done to try to turn back the clocks. And, and just to note that, you know, there are all sorts of factors that go into a person or a family's decision to, to have a right. child, to bring a new, a new life uh, into theirs. And Rebecca, I'm also wondering, I mean, when we talk about this, where you're going to bring a child into the world or not, there's all kinds of things financially, emotionally, mentally that go into that. And I guess I'm just wondering, too, what it, how would you describe the infrastructure we have, both in Massachusetts and beyond, to support childbearing people, be they mothers, parents in general? I mean, when we talk about, you mentioned not having paid family medical leave in place in a way that would make people feel comfortable structuring their lives around parenthood. I talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and, and I'll talk as a, as a parent of two girls myself. So, you know, we're really lucky that in Massachusetts we have paid family medical leave. I think that's critical for, um, for parents and caregivers. Um, we don't have universal pre-K. Um, I know that that's something that the Massachusetts Senate is talking about taking up today. I think that's an absolutely critical piece of making um, folks able to parent. Um, we also have some of the highest um, out-of-pocket deductibles for um, prenatal care, for all pregnancy care. And that's something that we have been raising um, with the legislature that, you know, for regardless of the kind of um, pregnancy care that you need, whether it's pre and postnatal care, labor and delivery, miscarriage management or abortion care, the cost of that care can be prohibitive and it can prevent you from getting that care earlier. And so we want to make sure that you have the kind of structural support that you need to make whatever decision um, is right for you. We have a question here from an audience member. 
forum, it's really helpful to have this, to have a place to come talk about it. I have two different questions. One is we're focusing all of this on the women, which we need to do, but what do we, how are we talking to the men who are creating part of this problem? <laughs> Great no point. One is, no one is addressing that. And, you know, there are so many thoughts out there, but what can we actually do? So that's the first question. And the second question is, does HIP, do HIPAA laws um, protect people if they need, say, a DNC and why something would be needed and medication? I think we should nail those fathers and make sure they pay for the moment <laughs> yeah. the baby's born to the kid is 21 years old. I mean, it's amazing that no one, where is, where, everybody knows in their life fathers were not supporting their children, right? In Massachusetts, we're better than other places, but we're not great either. Um, you know? and, yeah, and I mean, so often we, we limit our conversation about reproductive care to yes. women, right? When we know that there, has been, there have been conversations about male birth control, all sorts of other ways to not put all of that on uh, the person who would be carrying a child in many instances who's a woman, right? Because um, we also talk about people who, who bear children um, of other gender identifying communities. But yeah, I mean, Marjorie, it's funny because I immediately looked at you because I know that this is something you talk about on BPR. Yeah, there's a certain amount of hostility there that, is, that there's not real tough child support laws and there's not real uh, sharing of the costs of, of childbearing. And I, but I don't know the answer on the- I, I will the say this, that'll make you just more depressed. Oh. Uh, Renee Landers, that we just, who we just spoke to, had, uh, has for years, I don't know if she continues to have a question on one of her tests for her students. Um, and it's about what yeah, scenario in which the woman is pregnant and what happens. It's a, you know, a legal situation. And she says, pretty much without fail, few people say, well, what about the father? Exactly. <laughs> it's so inbred mm -hmm. exactly. in how we think. So maybe it's just a massive beginning to rethink. And Rebecca, I don't know if you know the answer to the question about the DNC, which is the procedure that many women who have miscarriages go, go through, which is similar to an abortion. I mean, what about the, the HIPAA laws? Do we know? Yeah, well, I think the question was, does HIPAA protect our privacy if we are, in fact, getting abortion care? And certainly it does. It does. That is not something that folks need to worry about. What you do need to worry about is data protection. So if you're Googling abortion clinic, if you're, um, you know, if you're Googling unintended pregnancy, your period tracker app, um, we do need to be really careful about what we're putting out uh, on the internet. And you say more, a little bit more about that, Rebecca, because does that mean, I mean, what do you use incognito windows? Do you delete that period, track, period tracking app? Like what and exactly? does deleting it, delete it forever? Exactly, is yeah. it on the cloud? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is deleting it does not delete it forever. Um, but certainly using incognito mode, we are working, I mean, we are just playing, we're drinking from the fire hose right now, and data protections are one of the things that we are trying to figure out so that we can make sure folks searching for abortion care here in Massachusetts are not having their data sold um, mm -hmm. to brokers so that they could be targeted. Wow. Yeah. Marjorie, do we have a, Yes, we Lisa in, in Boston is on the phone. Hi, Lisa. So I... I'm loving this discussion. I appreciate what you're doing. And I don't know if we can somehow take the religion, take the politics, even take the facts out of it because people don't agree. But I think it's, as a woman, it's very frustrating that somebody is telling me to put my health at risk. I mean, we can all agree that women are the ones who get pregnant. They're the ones that carry the child. And there are risks involved with that. And unless these people who are pro-life are willing to make a law that says, let's say Jim Browdy needs a kidney to live, and Brett Kavanaugh is a perfect match, if I need to be told by law I have to risk my well-being to have an unborn child, is it that much of a leap to say, you know what, Jim Browdy needs to give up a kidney for Brett Kavanaugh? I don't see that happening. <laughs> You know, I can't, I mean, if you take out mm. all of the religion yeah. and politics, yeah. to that's me, true. that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Re Re Rebecca, yeah. I'd love to give you a chance to respond to that. Yeah, I, a really important point is that most people of faith are pro-choice. And 
actually, this is not a divisive political issue. If you look at the data and you look at the polling, just in Massachusetts, we did a poll, and you know, almost 75% of Catholic people um, believe that Roe should be codified. This is a winning political issue. Nobody lost their seat in the Massachusetts legislature because of their vote on the Roe Act. It, it's actually not as divisive as we think, but it has been exploited by a minority that is obsessed with power and control. And so I, I totally agree with Lisa that we need to be in control of our own bodies, but I don't want, I, I don't want to feed the narrative that this is divisive because it's actually not. Rebecca Hartholder is the executive director of Reproductive Equity Now. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My pleasure. Coming up, we will take a look at how Massachusetts is positioned to respond to the growing demand of people seeking abortion access and reproductive care as states across the country move to ban or restrict access. Our community conversation continues here at the Boston Public Library on 89.7 GBH and live on our YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash GBH News. Please stay with us. Join GBH News on YouTube for stories, conversations, and trusted local news. Subscribe today at youtube.com slash GBH News. Support for our programs comes from you and the Boston Public Market in downtown Boston, offering fresh, regionally sourced food, prepared meals, and specialty items from 30 local farmers and artisans. This message funded by the Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism. Discover how North Adams, Massachusetts, transitioned from a small town in economic collapse to become part of the global art world in just a few decades. Don't miss Museum Town, tonight at 9 on GBH2. I'm reporter Craig Lamolt, and this is 89.7 WGBH, WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. Boston's local NPR. I'm Marjorie Egan. Welcome back to Community Conversation, Row Overturned. We are live on 89.7 GBH, and we are streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News, broadcasting for our GBH studio at the Boston Public Library. I am joined by my colleagues Callie Crossley of Under the Radar with Callie Crossley and Paris Alston, co-host of the morning show on, on GBH. What's the name of the morning show? Morning Edition. Thank you very much. <laughs> morning Edition. <laughs> Every morning, and she gets up very early to get there and do that job. We're talking through what the overturning of Roe v. Wade means for the people of Massachusetts. And we looked at this from a legal and legislative angle. Now we're focusing on access to abortions and reproductive care. Supreme Court ruling is expected to lead to abortion bans in roughly half the states in America, making Massachusetts a comparably safe haven for people in search of an abortion, uh, with abortion care providers anticipating the influx of people if coming to Massachusetts for the kind of care they can no longer get elsewhere. Where are we ready to provide that kind of care and how can we provide it? So joining us on the line to talk about this is somebody who knows everything about this. She's Carrie Baker. Uh, she's a professor of the study of women and gender at Smith College. She also works with the Planned Parenthood Advocacy Fund and the Abortion Fund in Western Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Carrie Baker, for being with us uh, to share your expertise. We also want to tell people you can still call. We've got another half hour of this to go. You can call us at 877-301-8970 or uh, you can text us at that very same number or tweet us at GBH News. You know, Carrie Baker, I said you know everything about this because you've written so much about uh, uh, abortion, but I wanted to put this in kind of a perspective of your academic uh, perspective. You know, you, you study gender, law, policy, and feminist social movements. This is not particularly a moment of a feminist social movement going forward, but, but where do you see this in terms of gender relations, equality between the genders? after this Supreme Court decision. I actually think this Supreme Court decision threatens most of the gains that women have made over the last 50 years. If you look at the reasoning of the court, what they said is that if a right is not explicit in the Constitution, if it wasn't intended by the guys back in 1868 who adopted the 14th Amendment, and if there's not a long history of that right being established, then you don't have the right. And Quite frankly, 
you know, the guys weren't thinking about women in 1868 and women didn't have many rights back then. And so I think that the reasoning of Dobbs could be used to underline a whole range of women's rights, like for instance, Griswold versus Connecticut, which guaranteed access to contraception. And the, the later case that was a Massachusetts case, Eisenstadt versus Baird, which guaranteed single people the right to contraception. I think this decision could undermine women's equality rights under the Equal Protection Clause, because the Equal Protection Clause passed in 1868 was not intended to protect women. That was a later interpretation. And, you know, Scalia, who used to be on the court, said that the Equal Protection Clause wasn't meant to protect women from discrimination. So, you know, I, I think that this, this decision really undermines a lot of women's gains from the last 50 years and that we really need to be pushing back. We really need to, quite frankly, fight for the Equal Rights Amendment, which the Trump administration blocked. Well, talk about that. We have a big advocate, Wendy Murphy, who's worked very tirelessly for years yeah. on the Equal Rights Amendment here in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Talk about that in relationship to uh, the Roe decision. Yeah. So. One very striking thing about the Dobbs decision was that Alito referenced a 1974 decision called Gedoldig versus ALO, and it involved a California disability plan that excluded pregnancy. And at the time, feminists sued and said, well, it's sex discrimination if it, if it excludes pregnancy, because mostly it's women who get pregnant. And the Supreme Court said, no, it's not discriminating against women. It only discriminates between pregnant people and non-pregnant people. And that decision was absurd at the time. The Supreme Court um, did a, a similar case in an employment discrimination context under Title VII. It was called GE versus Geduldig. And in that case, the Supreme Court um, was overruled by Congress. They passed the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, right? So we're protected with that act. But the Gedoldig decision was never overturned, and, the, and Alito cited that decision to say, don't think you're going to get abortion rights by arguing that it violates women's equality. And so, you know, we, the Equal Rights Amendment, which, you know, Trump blocked, is a potential new way that we could, because it's a new amendment to the Constitution, that we could argue that banning abortion disproportionately impacts women and therefore it violates women's equal opportunity to participate in the workforce and in education and therefore we need to um, you know striking down any abortion bans on those grounds you know Carrie Baker you've also investigated how far women may have to travel right here in Massachusetts to get abortion care and how it's it many if not all of our state schools uh, young women there are cannot get so-called abortion uh, pills to induce an abortion. Uh, um, I always mispronounce them, so I'm not going to try. But uh, they can't get those at their schools. They have to travel miles to get those. So give us the update there. Yeah, so I did research. So none of the 13 public university campuses in Massachusetts offer abortion pills. They could. It's very easy. It doesn't take any special technology. They could give those to people, but they don't. And so I did research trying to determine what kind of burden does that impose on college students in Massachusetts and determined that women and people who can get pregnant have to travel long distances to get to the nearest abortion clinic. I'll give you an example of University of Massachusetts of Amherst out here where I live. It's 24 miles to get to the nearest abortion clinic in Springfield from the University of Massachusetts campus. Round trip, that's uh, 48 miles on a public transportation that takes two hours and 18 minutes one way and 79% of students at UMass don't have cars and so you're basically making people take a whole day to ride the bus all the way into Springfield get the pill they need and then go back to the campus when in fact you could just offer it right on campus so our representative out here lindsay savadosa has introduced legislation to require public university health centers to offer abortion pills and this is really important because post row when abortion is no longer available in many parts of the country and people flock to massachusetts from other states 
waiting periods are going to get longer. It's going to be harder to get the care we need. So we need more providers offering these pills. And college university health centers are a great place to start. Carrie, I have a question for you from Brian from Southboro. Go ahead, Brian. You're on with us and with Carrie Baker. Hey, thank you. Um, so my partner and I, we live in Massachusetts. We also have a place in Maine. And there were two gay guys. We, we want to contribute. Um, is there a website that we can uh, go to to kind of put our names in to be um, kind of a host for people coming in who need an abortion but can't pay for hotels or anything like that? Um, is, is there something that we could you know, offer our, our name up to? Great so question, Brian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, um, if somebody wanted to host somebody coming from out of state, um, how, do you, how do you do that? So I would suggest that you contact the abortion rights funds in Massachusetts. There's three of them. There's the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts out here. There's Emma, the Emma Fund in Boston. And then there's the Jane Fund in Worcester. So depending on where you live, those are three funds. There's also another one called Tides for Women. It's a new fund and they're focusing in particular on housing. Um, nationally, there's a group called the Bridget Alliance that focuses on helping people get housing. I think primarily they raise money for people to pay for hotel rooms, but um, they certainly are a good organization if you're interested in helping people traveling from out of state. Yeah, you know, we want to talk in a second about a little more about what we can do about this if you are trying to restore abortion rights. But I, I think one of the things that about Massachusetts that people should know, and and you talked about uh, just, Justice Alito referring to unborn human beings repeatedly in his in his decision, that there is a possibility of a Republican Congress and a Republican president voting personhood into law in the United States of America, which would override. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, yeah, I believe it would override uh, our abortion laws here and outlaw abortion all across the country. Yeah, when I read the opinion and saw that he used that phrase, unborn human beings, so many times, what I became concerned about is that he was teeing up a challenge to abortion laws like in the state of Massachusetts that protect the right to abortion. And here's what the argument would be. Unborn human beings have full 14th Amendment protections. Uh, abortion violates the right to life of unborn human beings and therefore is unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court could definitely do that. I don't know if you saw this, but just about an hour ago, President Biden announced that we need to get rid of the filibuster yes. to pass a federal law protecting abortion rights. I think that's a wonderful sign. He's been very resistant to getting rid of the filibuster. He spent so many years in the Senate and very much believes in the rules of the Senate. But I think that he realizes that we are really at a critical time. We have got to get rid of the filibuster. We have to pass the Women's Health Protection Act, which is a federal law that would protect abortion rights in all 50 states. Now, the Supreme court could still strike that down uh, if they said unborn human beings have the right to life and therefore those laws violate the constitution that's why i think we also need to expand the supreme court add four more seats and so that biden could balance out the court because the court is unnaturally skewed towards the conservative right because mitch mcconnell stole that seat for merrick garland in 2016 right at the end of um uh, the last, you know, presidency, Obama's presidency, and then, of course, rushed through the Amy Coney Barrett nomination at the very end of Trump's um, presidency. So I really think that to right that wrong, we need to add seats on the Supreme Court. Um, I just wanted to follow up uh, your comment about President Biden. Uh, I thought it was rather significant as well when he mentioned that he would be willing to consider removing the, the filibuster uh, in order to move legislation on um, protecting abortion rights. However, there have been two, now, uh, admitted, we've been, you know, it's been a week or so, so we're still in the processing, but there have been two polls, one national, one in Massachusetts. The question has been asked, is this an issue that will drive you to the polls, that mm. will make you think hard about who you support? And the answer has been, not, not at the top of my list. Maybe that changes, but I wonder, Carrie Baker, how you, how you react to that. To, you, you're talking about the issue of abortion? Yes. 
They, so, they, in, in the national poll and in the poll in Massachusetts, it's not enough to drive me, to, to make me vote, uh, to drive me, to motivate me to vote, rather. Yeah. So I think it depends on what groups you're looking at. Young people, it absolutely is, a will drive young people to the polls. Young people are the people that have the most at stake with abortion rights. They're still in their reproductive ages. So I think that maybe if you look overall, maybe that's true. Although I think that it, you know, I think that from my, from what I've seen of the polls, it is something that will drive people to the polls. But I know that if you look specifically at young people, and that is a group that only votes at about 20%. And I know that the advocacy groups that I work with are really focusing on college students and young people mm -hmm. to get them in the votes, to vote. And particularly in, there's eight key states that Democrats need to focus on. There's four states where we need to keep Democrats, and that would be uh, Warnock in Georgia, uh, Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire, Mark Kelly in Arizona, and Catherine Cortez Masto in Nevada. And then there's four states where we have a shot at gaining Democratic seats. That's John Fetterman in Pennsylvania, Tim Ryan in Ohio, Cherry Lynn Beasley in North Carolina, and um, Sarah um, in Wisconsin, Sarah, and I forget, I'm forgetting her name right now, um, but um, Sarah Godlewski. Mm -hmm. And so if we can pick up two more seats in the Senate and overcome the filibuster after the midterm elections, then we can not only pass abortion rights, but we can pass voting rights, the ERA, and many other right, gun rights, immigration rights, climate change. There is so much that is absolutely critical. If we focus, like young voters absolutely care about climate change and gun laws in addition to reproductive rights. We need to reach out to, we, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Democrats and abortion rights supporters. We need to reach out to those young people and educate them about these issues and how we can really make a difference if we can just pick up two more people in the Senate and also of course maintain the House. Here's a story from a, a texter. I was 32 years old, married, financially stable, wanting a baby when my fetus died at 12 weeks. I spent two days trying to expel the dead fetus, finally went to my physician who offered me a DNC or the option of going home to wait. I chose the DNC, thankfully, because by the time I got on the table at the hospital, my blood pressure was so low, the nurse took away the pillow under my head and would not let me sit up for three hours. Had I gone home alone, I might have had a stroke before my husband got home from work. The whole process might have turned turned septic and killed me. So she said she wants these men making these laws to understand what it feels like to expel a failed fetus mm -hmm. and what it feels like to go through an experience like this. Uh, I'm sure you've heard stories like this before. Uh, Carrie Baker, what do you think? Well, I make the argument that banning abortion is most dangerous for people who have wanted pregnancies and when they're trying to carry the pregnancies to term. You know, People that want abortions are probably, a lot of them are going to get abortion pills, which are extremely safe. Um, you know, it will definitely harm some people, but I think many more people carry pregnancies to term than get abortions each year. And those are the people that are most going to be at risk because of these bans, because of exactly the kinds of thing you're talking about. Doctors will be afraid to do miscarriage care. They will be afraid to help women who are in crisis, who are bleeding, who are septic, because if there's still a fetal heartbeat or it's still cardiac cardiac activity, they're going to worry that they will be criminally prosecuted. In Texas, you could end up in jail for 10 years for doing an abortion and just having to prove that, oh, it was, her life was on the line. Many of these life exceptions to these abortion bans are very narrow and very difficult to prove, oh, you know, her life was on the line. I have a friend who's a, um, a psychiatrist, a um, gynecological psychiatrist in Texas, and she said that they are sending women who are hemorrhaging home. They are sending women home whose um, sacs have have pierced. You know, the her um, the sac that the in, that the um, fetus is in has broken, but because there's still a fetal heartbeat, they can't treat them. Oh. So they send them home and say, wait until there's an infection, and then we can treat you. We're talking with Carrie Baker. She's a professor of the study of women and gender at Smith College. We have a a, a, a live chat stream question from Irene 
and you've written about this, the impact of these laws on IVF, uh, in vitro fertilization, mm -hmm. which is quite mm -hmm. common mm -hmm. in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts because our insurance covers it here. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think this decision definitely endangers IVF because IVF often entails creating embryos that you either don't use or that you have to remove once they're implanted. You know, the, the folks that are against abortion are also against stem cell research and any sort of scientific process that entails the potential destruction of fertilized eggs or embryos. By the way, I think this decision also endangers contraception. If yes. you remember the Hobby Lobby case from a yes. few years mm -hmm. ago, Hobby Lobby objected to several forms of contraception saying that they thought it was abortificence, things like IUDs or emergency contraception. And, you know, what's to stop the states from saying, well, we believe this is an abortion, so you can no longer get emergency contraception. You can no longer get IUDs. Folks in the anti-abortion movement, some think that all hormonal contraception can have abortificent effects. And so I think some states could potentially try to ban all forms of hormonal contraception. And that to me is really, really worrying. You know, you know Carrie, as you're just, sorry, Marjorie, do we oh, have no, another go question? Ahead. I was just saying, as Carrie was describing all of that, um, I'm thinking about conversations that we've had about you, Marjorie and Callie, having lived at a time where Roe wasn't, where the constitutional right to abortion was not protected, and then it was. I, being of a different generation and having always lived in a time where it was, and now suddenly we are having, we're doing this shift, right? Not necessarily in Massachusetts, but nationwide. Um, my peers and I, and just, I guess I'm wondering, like, both, what, what was it like to witness that shift and how is some of the stuff that Carrie is saying and describing and that we're hearing, are you worried about returning to that? But then also, Carrie, are we ready for that? Do you think people are getting that this is going to become reality again for some people? Well, you know, I was, uh, this was a situation for when I was grown. I don't remember people in like high school or college or anything. Mm -hmm. if that, it, I'm sure it probably happened, but I don't remember that. But in when I was grown and grown folks were trying to make decisions about their lives, uh, some made a decision um, after bad experiences. Um, some were, I'm talking really bad, like rape. Um, um, and then others, because it was just really the wrong, they were not prepared to care for a child. And it was a lot of agony on their part to make the decision, but it absolutely made a difference in terms of the rest of their lives. It just did. Um, I'm very distressed that in this conversation, the fact that there are so many of these laws that don't even take into account rape and incest or that mental trauma, the depths of it that people have. So to force someone to carry to term, um, the product of that is really horrific because again, I've, you know, know people who've had to suffer that. It's, it's really scary. And so a lot of people, you know, again, underground, underground kinds of tactics because they were determined to get it done. And it, you know, before it was legal and then afterwards, it was still agonizing when it was legal. It's mm. not, this is not something people just do cavalierly. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. needs to be understood. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this gets back to the gender yeah. issue. You know, I heard Asa Hutchinson, the governor of Arkansas, on television the other morning, and someone asked him about exactly that. What happens, I think it was Chuck Todd, actually, I meet the press, what happens if a 13-year-old uh, is carrying the incestuous child of her father? Mm -hmm. What happens? And Hutchinson says, well, you know, I, I would prefer it weren't that way, but that's kind of the way it goes. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, how can anybody think like this? This is where the whole, um, the, the misogyny and, the, and yeah. the lack of care for women and the status of women that you've written about and studied extensively, Carrie Baker, just kind of hits you over the head. Yeah, yeah I, I think we all need to remember, we live in a society that's rampant with sexual violence. And, you know, while obviously many cases of sexual violence, people don't end up pregnant, but in many cases they do. And to me, and one thing I've argued in my own writing is that sexual violence and forced pregnancy are two sides of the same coin. And that coin is misogyny. Mm -hmm. It's a disrespect of women's bodily autonomy, of the right to determine who comes into their body and who doesn't and when. And they're both forms of violence. Uh, it, abortion bans, I believe, are a form of violence. It, it leads to, I mean, 
particularly for black women, in the state of Mississippi, mm -hmm. childbirth is 75 times more dangerous than abortion. I get that quote from the dissent in the Dobbs decision. Yep. 75 times more dangerous. Mississippi is a state that's done nothing to lower their really high maternal mortality rate that falls disproportionately on black women. And by the way, infant mortality rate too, which falls disproportionately on black babies. They don't seem to care about that. They're not putting policies in place to address that, but they're banning abortion to make that problem worse. And so I really have to question, what is the motivation of these people? You know, they're not about protecting babies. No. They're not, they're certainly not about protecting women. And, you know, I argue in my writing, and this is a whole nother part, but I really think it's about white supremacy. They want more white babies, and then they'll suppress the votes of black people. And then the white people, as they become more and more of a minority, will be able to maintain political power. And again, I've studied the history of this issue, and that may be kind of shocking for people to hear me say that, but there's a lot of really incredible scholarship showing how closely aligned the anti-abortion movement is with white supremacy. Carrie Baker from Smith College, we only have a couple of minutes left, so let's try to leave this on a hopeful note. What can we do? So one thing I would say is get out and vote in the fall elections and volunteer in those eight states I mentioned, send your money to those candidates, uh, do text banking, travel down to those states if you can, um, uh, go down to Georgia and work with Raphael Warnock uh, and Stacey Abrams, who's amazing. And But I would also say, I do a lot of writing on abortion pills. The fact of the matter is, is that folks can easily order abortion pills online and have them mailed to their homes. And there's a great organization called plancpills.org and you can learn more about how to order abortion pills. They're safer than Tylenol. You can get them online from abroad for $109, sliding scale fee through aidaccess.org. So this is today's underground abortion movement. It's ordering pills by mail. Pre-row, you didn't have the internet, you didn't have abortion pills. Women were filling, filling emergency rooms, septic and hemorrhaging. That's not going to happen post row because of abortion pills, but we need to get the word out there and we need to get the pills in people's hands. So I really, I encourage everybody, you should be tweeting and sharing on Facebook information, plancpills.org and aid access. Are you, are you hopeful before you go? Do you think we're going to be able to get over this, return this to what it's it was? It's a hard fight. Okay. Our country is in a state of crisis. Our democracy is in a state of crisis. All hands on deck right now. We all need to be fighting for voting rights, for abortion rights, for all the things that we're losing now. Well, Carrie Baker, thank you so much for joining us. We much appreciate your time. Carrie Baker is a professor of the study of women and gender at Smith College. She also works with the Planned Parenthood Advocacy Fund and the Abortion Fund in Western Massachusetts. Thank you all for joining us today uh, to our special coverage of the abortion issue at the end of Roe v. Wade. For ongoing coverage, keep your dial on 89.7, and you can also stream us at gbhnews.org. Follow us on GBH2, Greater Boston uh, weeknights as well. Uh, thank you very much to Callie Crossy, who was with us from uh, the Callie Crossy Show, and from Paris, Austin. Give us the name of the morning show. <laughs> I, I don't have it in front of me, and I forgot the name. Edition. Morning, morning edition. edition. Boy, that's a tough one to remember, <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Anything you want to say? We have like a minute left. Anything you'd like to add, ladies? Uh, I would just say thank you to everyone who texted, called, came up to the mic, and gave your input. You asked your questions. We appreciate it. I would say that the conversation continues. This is not a one and done conversation. And uh, so folks could, should con continue to send in comments and thoughts and, and call I, in. And I would like to say we were overwhelmed with texts and phone calls. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but I do appreciate uh, everyone who texted and called and for the people that came down to the Boston Public Library uh, to join us. I'm Marjorie Egan. Thank you again for joining us today and keep the fight going. Not that with Boston.